Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to be covering the debt to equity ratio here, which actually spans a couple different topics across three statement modeling, valuation, credit analysis, and others. So the basic definition here is pretty simple. The debt to equity ratio is defined as the company's total debt divided by its common shareholders equity. So I'm going to pull up financials for the company that we'll be using as examples in this lesson, Builders First Source in the building materials business. And if we just go to their most recent fiscal year as of the time of this tutorial and take their total debt and divide by their common shareholders equity, that gives us their debt to equity ratio of 67%. And the idea is that this ratio measures the overall risk from leverage and it could indicate the cost of the company's next debt issuance if they choose to issue debt in the future. If this ratio is higher, it's probably going to cost more to issue even more debt above what the company currently has. You have to be careful though, because in some cases, such as with valuation, you actually want to use the market values of these items instead. So you find the market value of the debt in the company's filings, and then instead of using the common shareholders equity, you take their market cap or equity value. So I have another example in this same file. If you go over here to the WAC tab, and in this WAC analysis, when we look at the debt to equity ratio here, and we use it to unlever beta and then relever it, these are both based on the market values of these items. So the market value of each company's debt, the market value of their equity or equity value. And then when we relever it for builders first source down here to get the levered beta, we're also using the market value of equity and the market value of debt to do this. And we're using the debt to equity ratio here based on these market values. So you just have to be careful about which one you're using when. A lot of people ask, what is a good debt to equity ratio or what debt to equity ratio should a company have? And that's really the wrong question. The right way to think about it is how does this company's debt to equity ratio compare to its peer companies and its historical numbers based on both book and market values? Now, generally speaking, most companies benefit from a modest amount of debt. So up to a certain point, it actually helps them because it provides cheaper capital. It gives them more funds to expand at possibly a lower rate. But companies also start to suffer once this ratio goes high, because once you get to a certain level, the cost of equity and cost of debt rise, the risk of bankruptcy and default rise. And so you have to strike sort of a happy medium where the debt is not too low, but it's also not too high. And that's the best way to think about this. So I'm going to go into all these topics in more detail. If you want the written version, the Excel files, and a lot of the other documents here, you can go to this URL on screen. It's our financial statement analysis page, debt to equity ratio. I'll pin this URL below the comments so you can just go down and click on it as the first comment and get everything there. In this tutorial, I'm going to cover the basic calculations first, then we'll go through what a good debt to equity ratio means. We'll talk about debt to equity and evaluation, and then we'll talk about debt to equity in credit analysis and some things to watch out for there. So the basic calculations are pretty simple. The main point really is that you want to include only the company's debt and then only their common shareholders equity. So you have to be very careful not to include other components of the total equity, such as preferred stock or non-controlling interests. Some sources also claim that you should use total liabilities in the numerator, but this doesn't really make sense because items like accrued expenses and accounts payable, for example, are short-term operational items that don't have interest attached. They're not interest-bearing, and so they don't really affect the company's risk in the same way that actual interest-bearing debt does. So we never do this, although you will see some sources like Investopedia saying it's a good idea. If we go back to the builder's first source model here, I just have their historical statements on screen over the past six or seven years here up through the time of this video. I already made the first calculation for the debt to equity ratio. There's also something called the debt to total capital ratio. And to do this, to calculate this, we can take the total debt and then divide by the total debt plus the total equity on their balance sheet, the common shareholders equity really right here. And so when we lay out these ratios, I think the conclusions are pretty clear. This company's debt to equity ratio has gone down tremendously. Their debt to total capital ratio has also gone down quite significantly as well. And so looking at this as investors, we'd say that the company has delevered and they're not using nearly as much debt relative to their equity as they were before. And I think the interesting part here is that if you look at their numbers and especially their revenue, it's very clear that this company has made some transformative acquisitions going from seven or eight billion in revenue to more like 18 or 22 or 23 billion in revenue over these five or six years shown here. So they've clearly made some really big acquisitions, but despite all that, they haven't actually increased their leverage all that much. They've actually delevered even as they've grown aggressively through acquisitions, which we would view as a positive sign in this case. Now to this point about what a good debt to equity ratio means. 
A lot of people would say that a lower ratio is better and a higher ratio is worse. And that's a little bit of a simplification and it doesn't really tell the whole story. The more accurate way to think about it is that you generally want a company's debt to equity ratio to be close to its peer companies based on both the book values and the market values of these items. If the company is using too little debt, that could mean that its cost of capital is too high and that it's not taking advantage of debt, which is almost always cheaper than equity. On the flip side, if the company's debt balance is too high, that means that its default risk might be too high and that it ends up paying far too much for its debt. So maybe it no longer provides the same cost advantages that it did at a much lower debt to equity ratio. So to show you an example of this, let's go over to the WAC tab in our file here and I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna open up the grouping right here. So if we look at the peer companies for Builders First Source, I have seven other building material and distribution companies based in the US right here. On average, the debt to equity ratio based on the book values of each company's debt and equity is around 83%. Builders First Source is also at exactly 83%, so they match up very well. If you base these on the market values instead, the median number is around 17 or 18%, and Builders First Source is at exactly 20% right now. So what this tells us is that this company is operating well within the bounds of this industry and is very well matched to the types of capital that its peer companies, similar companies in a similar industry in a similar size are actually using. Let's talk about debt to equity in a valuation context now. So the most common way this comes up in valuation is that if you are building an unlevered DCF and using WAC, the weighted average cost of capital for the discount rate, then the debt to equity ratio is used when unlevering and relevering beta in this calculation. So the formula for unlevered beta here is on screen. You take the levered beta, so the number that you see on Bloomberg or FactSet or Capital IQ or other sources, and then you divide by one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate plus the preferred stock to common equity ratio. And then to relever beta, you take the unlevered beta and then you multiply by that whole term instead. The idea here is that you want to remove the risk from leverage to isolate the company's inherent business risk and then you relever based on the company's capital structure to reflect the additional risk from that capital structure. So let's go into Excel and take a look at how this works. If you look at the unlevered beta calculation for each of the comparables here, essentially what we're doing is taking the levered beta that we found on capital IQ, and then we're dividing by that whole term. One plus D14 divided by each 14 is just the debt divided by the equity, in other words, the debt to equity ratio, we multiply by one minus the tax rate because the interest paid on debt is tax deductible, which reduces the risk a little bit. And then we have the preferred to equity ratio here at the end. None of these companies except for one even have preferred stocks, so this is basically irrelevant. And if you look at how this works, in each case, the unlevered beta is lower than the levered beta because we're removing that risk from leverage. And then when we calculate relevered beta for our company, Builders First Source, You'll see how the levered beta here, the relevered beta, is higher than the unlevered beta in each case because now we're adjusting for the actual debt that Builders First Source has. Now, their debt levels are very moderate, 15%, 16.7%. These are debt to total capital numbers. So the levered beta is not that much bigger than the unlevered beta, but that is basically how it works. Now, if we had a case where Builders First Source had a much higher debt balance, so let's say they had $6 billion worth of debt, now the levered beta number is higher. All this goes up, the cost of equity goes up. Interestingly, the WAC number, the average WAC number here actually goes down slightly, but the cost of equity is definitely higher because now the equity is riskier because of the fact that they have a higher debt balance. And frankly, if we actually adjusted the cost of debt here to reflect the much higher debt balance, the WAC number would probably start increasing or at least stay the same at this point. So it's not entirely accurate, but that's the basic idea here. Generally speaking, the higher the debt to equity ratio, the more relevered beta keeps increasing and the cost of equity and cost of debt also go up. So above a certain level, WAC will actually start to increase, meaning that the company's implied value in a DCF is lower because of this added risk from the debt. Now, some people come to us and say, well, wait a minute, this is an unlevered DCF. How could the capital structure possibly affect the results? Because it's unlevered, the capital structure shouldn't affect anything, but that's not really the right way to look at it. The capital structure still affects the company's overall risk, even though it doesn't directly affect its cash flows in this unlevered analysis. And for a good example of this, I'm gonna pull up this file on enterprise value and how the capital structure changes when the debt to equity ratio changes. You can see here that as the company's debt to equity keeps going up and up, the cost of debt also goes up, the cost of equity also goes up, and with WAC, 
Initially, it stays about the same or goes down slightly, but then once you start getting up to higher and higher levels here, the WAC keeps increasing. Cost of equity really starts increasing once you get to very high levels for the debt to equity ratio. And you can see it pretty well in the graph here that things are relatively normal up until about 30 to 40% for the debt to total capital ratio. But then once you go above that, then you start getting pretty rapid increases in things like the cost of equity, for example. So that's generally how it works. And of course, when this happens, the implied enterprise value from a DCF starts dropping because the risk gets so much higher at these very high debt levels. Now, for the final topic here, I want to say a few brief words about the debt-to-equity ratio in credit analysis. Generally speaking, the debt-to-equity ratio is just one of many metrics that lenders look at to assess a company's credit profile. So you'll also see metrics like debt-to-EBITDA, EBITDA-to-interest, so the leverage and coverage ratios. You'll also see something like current assets divided by current liabilities or cash divided by current liabilities. We covered all of these in the tutorial video here on liquidity ratios, so you can refer back to that. I would say that in general, the income statement and cash flow statement based metrics are probably more important because lenders mostly care about debt service. So for example, a high debt to equity ratio might actually be fine if the company can actually pay for its interest relatively comfortably and also eventually repay or refinance the debt. With Builders First Source, I think you can see a pretty good example right here. Clearly, the debt to equity ratio is very high in the early years here, and so is the debt to total capital ratio. But Lenders might not necessarily have a problem with this because the debt to EBITDA ratio is not that outrageously high. 4.7x is on the high side, but it's not 8x or 10x or something really concerning like that. And similarly, it seems that from these numbers, the company can easily pay its interest. Its EBITDA is over twice its net interest, and in the later years, over four times its net interest. So despite these quite high numbers, the fact that the leverage and coverage ratios stay in healthy, a healthy range means that lenders would probably not be too concerned about the specific company. One other thing to watch out for is that if you're using metrics like return on equity, companies can easily manipulate this by changing around their debt levels. And for an example, if we go down here and just look at how this is calculated, return on equity equals the net income in a period divided by the average common equity in that period. And if a company has say 20% for its debt to total capital ratio, its return on equity might be in this 10 to 11% range. But then when the debt to total capital goes up to say 50%, now its return on equity also goes up and it goes up to more like 12, 13, 14, 15%, something like that. And it's all because they are simply using less equity in their capital structure. Now their operating income and EBITDA have stayed the same, but because of the fact that they're now choosing to use more debt, pay higher interest, their net income has decreased, their common equity has decreased, and as a result, their return on equity here has increased pretty substantially, but it's not because anything about the core business has changed, it's just because their capital structure has changed. And so in this case, if a company was actually doing this, you'd wanna look at something like return on invested capital or ROIC to look at this on more of a neutral basis and ignore those changes in capital structure. That's about it, so let's do a quick recap and summary. For the basic calculations, it's not too complicated. It's either debt divided by common shareholders' equity or the market value of debt divided by the market value of equity, depending on whether you're looking at this in terms of financial statement and credit analysis or an evaluation context. Don't use anything besides debt and don't add other components of total equity, such as preferred stock or non-controlling interest. It's just common shareholders' equity. For a good debt to equity ratio, it really depends on what other peer companies in the industry are doing. You generally want your company to be fairly close on both a book and market value basis. So those are some things to watch out for when you're valuing them or looking at them in a credit analysis and seeing what they look like compared to other peer companies. In a valuation context, a higher debt to equity ratio will increase the cost of debt, cost of equity, and up to a certain point, it might actually reduce whack because debt is cheaper than equity, but past a certain level, it will start to increase whack and therefore decrease the company's valuation. We covered a lot of these topics in some of the previous coverage here of whack and the discount rate. With a credit analysis, the debt to equity ratio is one metric that lenders will look at, but it's certainly not the only one. And they generally care a little bit more about the interest and coverage metrics because they ultimately care about how well a company can service its debt, pay for its interest, and eventually repay or refinance the debt. So that's a little bit about this concept. Hopefully now you have a better idea of how it works and you have some examples of how to use it when analyzing a company's financial statements and also building a simple valuation for them.